Hello lovelies! This isn't the video I intended to put out this week, but life seldom goes as we plan. I recently downloaded Mood's Winterberry Cape pattern. Now I have never used a pattern from Mood before, but I have used a couple PDF patterns. You all know my style more is to draft and drape and copy off existing garments, but I decided to give it a try. Now I have made capes before, and I don't believe capes really need a pattern for you to make them. However, I thought it would be a simple one to try, and the style of cape was slightly different than ones I worked with before. I quickly realized, however, that in spite of not saying so, this pattern was only designed for 60 inch wide fabric, and mine was about 43 inches, so I had to trim it a little bit to make it less wide and less long. I also found that their directions weren't the best, and that assembling even the paper pattern, as you can see, it's a little messy. It's a bit different than other PDF patterns I've worked with. So hopefully you can use my experience going forward. As I said, you don't really need a pattern to make a cape, but yeah, this, this wasn't the best pattern. And if I didn't kind of already know what I was doing, because I've made capes before, I would have maybe been a little lost. While the website shows this pattern made with some nice wool coating and a poly satin lining, um, those materials are quite expensive, and I'm trying to remove polyester from my wardrobe anyway, so I opt instead to use two layers of cotton flannel because I found it on sale for $3. It's also a very cozy, soft, and warm fabric, so I think that'll be very nice to wear kind of in early winter as it starts getting quite cold, which is how I intend to use this garment, but it doesn't have quite the same kind of high-end, high-fashion finish that their sample cloak does for this reason. If I use $25 yard wool coating material, I'm sure it would similarly look like hot couture, but I'm just a little hobbit with my woolly socks and my homemade skirt, so who needs runway fashion when you're built like a hobbit anyway, right? And as you can see, I'm still improvising when it comes to pattern weights, mostly using candles for this project. But hey, it works and they smell great. I just wouldn't recommend using them lit if you're placing them on paper patterns. You know, just for safety. So after I cut out the outer layer and the lining layer, which is slightly different, the outer layer is a little bit wider and has a sort of folded over front piece to meet the lining. So after I cut out both of those layers, using the black as the outer and the red as the inner, I started assembling the two pieces separately. I use mostly a backstitch, in some cases a running backstitch on longer seams, and had my trusty leather thimble to help me get through the thick fabric. It is pretty remarkable how strong hand stitches can be if you sort of take the time to learn the technique. My technique isn't amazing and my needles aren't the highest quality, but even still I'm able to make some pretty high quality, I think, garments. And this whole, this whole cape cost me, I would say, materials maybe $40, but I think a good deal less, and honestly $7 of that is for the metal clasp that I got. So after I had sewn both of them together, I layered them over each other to try them on, just to make sure it would sort of fit and the pieces fit together well. I wanted an oversized silhouette, so I went with a slightly bigger size than my dress size, and I did probably overestimate the shoulder because of that. My shoulders are fairly narrow, so as you can see, it kind of sticks out from them a little bit. Overall though, the fit is good. The two pieces, the lining and the outer, fit each other well, so I could move on to sewing them together. I spread out my outer layer on the floor to try and just size it up and start lining up the lining, but of course, someone wanted to help. Whether she was actually helpful is debatable, but I'm not taking her off the payroll yet. I would also like to say that I am wearing this skirt a lot in this video. 
multiple days, same skirt. Laundry done in between. I just really fancy this new skirt. and uh, You can see the making of it in my last video before this one. It seemed like it was time to take a break. I wasn't sure how much more I could get done, especially if this little one wanted to nap right in the middle of my project. When I could finally return to work on this project, I started attaching the lining to the outer. So as I mentioned before, the outer layer has this extra sort of panel in the front that sort of folds back in to the inside and then gets attached to the lining. So that's what I'm doing right here. I'm just laying that out and pinning it, folding over the raw edge of that panel so that it will be attached and safe and won't fray. Because as I discovered working on this project, cotton flannel frays quite a bit. And then I can start attaching it with a whip stitch. I had also lost my thimble at this point. It has been recovered since, but you'll see some shockingly unprotected sewing. I warn you, it's pretty graphic. It was then time to make the collar. For the traditional directions of this pattern, it shows the collar being made with just two pieces of the outer fabric, but since my outer and inner fabric were the same, I thought it would be fun to do red on the underside and black on the outside so that if I turn my collar up against the wind, you get that nice pop of the red lining color. So that's what I did. I cut one of each and then I sewed them together before flipping them inside out to attach them. Once the collar was on, it was time for another fitting for me to determine where I wanted my arm slits to be. Now, the pattern does have some armholes built into it so you can see where they suggest it but I just wanted to make sure it was at a comfortable place for me so that when I bent my arm it was just natural for me to be able to come through that armhole. So I marked it off with some chalk. Then I could just align my closure. I'm using a metal frog closure from M&J Trimmings. I think it's really cool and unique. It is the most expensive part of this though. It's about $7 just for one closure, but I think it's worth it and it gives a really distinct look. So I just figured out my placement for that as well and put pins in place. It's shaping up. It's starting to look like something, which is always exciting, don't you think? Although I'm not sure I would match it with that skirt in real life. The red and the burgundy is a bit of a choice started attaching the armhole facing from the pattern and I decided to do it in red to again bring that lining color out but as I attached it I realized I didn't like it it made it look quite costumey so I was going to replace it with that same facing in black but then I realized that because I'm using the same material in and out I didn't necessarily need that facing because I wasn't working with a slippery lining so instead, I just cut my armhole in 
and decided to take out this facing and just sew the sides together. And I think it actually worked out pretty well. I had to cut notches just to make sure it would all fold in neatly. And then I had to remove the facing that I spent like a half hour sewing on, but it's okay. It's not time wasted if you learn something. I'm not sure what I learned, but I learned something. When I finished this project, it did kind of feel like when you're putting something together, at the end you have a few screws left over. I didn't end up using those facing parts of the pattern, and I also had a collar facing piece that I didn't use, and when I read over the pattern instructions on Mood's pattern blog, had absolutely no instructions on how to use it. It's just like, attach the collar. Um, so, yeah, I, I found the instructions were a little vague. I think they just kind of expect you to be able to look at the pattern and know exactly how to do everything, which for more experienced sewers, perhaps, but yeah, it was a little bit challenging to just understand what they mean since I don't use patterns that often. And so I didn't end up using the collar facing either. Hopefully I haven't made a terrible mistake, but I think it looks good. I paired it here with the 17th century chemise that I made for my Artemisia Gentileschi project, which I will someday be able to finish, who knows when, but I'll try. And I feel like when paired with this historical garment, it very much gives that look of very maidenly, I'm in a gothic romance fleeing a manor house late at night. Although I think a, a hood would even be better for that than just the collar. But I think this is also a versatile piece that will work for regular dress, which is what I intended, just to be an early winter replacement for a winter coat. So here I paired it with just a pair of jeans and a kind of baggy oversized sweater. See, I have normal clothes too. I just don't usually pair them together like this. But I think it's cute. Again, maybe not as couture looking as it would be with the recommended materials but I like it. It's comfortable. It's very cozy. It was very cold and rainy the other night and I just kind of curled up in it on the couch. So I really have no complaints. So if you enjoyed this, please give it a like so that I know that this is the kind of content you'd like me to make more of. Um, leave a comment if you've had experience with moods, patterns, and what you thought. And if you want to see what I get up to next, please subscribe. I'll have a few more making videos coming soon. I appreciate you stopping by and if you made it this far, congratulations. Bye.